Yes, sir. What you know about it? Welcome back to episode 70 of the Northern Steel Podcast. Draft is days away, people. We're looking at a week and a couple a change, a couple of quarters. We have today we're talking about wide receiver prospects. Thank you for clicking on this episode to learn a little bit about the wide receiver prospects Chris and I enjoy and uh, to just become part of the Northern Steel community and listen to what we have to say. So, Chris, if you have been listening, you know that he had a baby and I've been doing this thing solo. Well, he has was able to record some player prospects and listen and give his reaction and thoughts on them. And I'll put those in the podcast and kind of talk about what I think about his players quickly as well. Um, usually we start this off with NFL news, not on NFL news this week uh, or since the last time I did the podcast, which was four days ago. Um, so we're just going to jump right into some NFL prospects. Now, I guess the only NFL news or NFL rumor you could assume that they would be there is the Steelers trade rumors have uh, been steadily climbing. The trade rumors have been sprung up again into the foregrounds of uh, Mar thought process potentially, and it's for a big time wide receiver. Lots of rumors that could still be Brandon Ayuk from San Francisco. If Brandon Ayuk is traded for for the Steelers, this episode doesn't matter anymore. They will not. I don't think they'll be drafting wide receiver anymore if they do trade for Ayuk. Or even T. Higgins, which is a rumor that they're interested in T. Higgins, but I doubt the Bengals trade within the division. Um, They could trade for Teller Lockett, for um, uh, John Mechie, we did a discuss about. There's lots of options they could trade for, but maybe they're after the draft, depending on how the dominoes fall. But if the IU trade goes through, look for this to episode not to matter. But if you're just curious to hear about players in general from the draft, hear our opinions about uh, who who's good, who's bad, and and uh, if you have a different team than Steelers that you like, if you're listening right now and you're a Viking fan, maybe because we are from Minnesota and you hear these wide receivers and think, hey, we'll take another weapon. You know, we have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison. Then take a listen to these wide receivers and see if some of these tickle your fancy. Otherwise, we'll be jumping straight into it. I will be talking about my picks first and then I'll be playing Chris's audio. I'll give a quick interaction. This will be a quick episode today. And then next podcast will be doing cornerbacks i know that's a big point of emphasis for the Steelers as well i'll be looking at some cornerbacks a lot of slot cornerbacks on there too since i don't want to really go not, i mean i don't really want to go in the season with dante jackson as cornerback too definitely don't want to go in the season with chin and sullivan as the slot cornerback but with that being said let's just jump right into our first one who is adonai mitchell out of texas adonai mitchell is also one of the only wide receivers uh not the only one but one of the higher draft grade prospects uh, that has a top 30 visit with the Steelers. Um, I can, you know, pull up that list again to look for that. Um, sometime in the near future. Steelers, top 30 visits in 2024. With a pre-draft tracker. Oh, I don't want it like that, though. Here we go. Visit tracker. Scroll on down. Okay, no, we got we got a couple on our list, but first, Adonai Mitchell, uh, one of the top draft prospects. Let's, let's go through like like we did with the linemen. We went through the NFL.com tra- uh, draft profile scout grade, and then we'll go over his highlights a little bit. Adonai Mitchell is six two, two hundred five pounds, thirty two and three ace arms, a wingspan. Nine inch hands. He is graded as a 6.35, will eventually be a plus starter. His production score was 72, which is 17th. His athleticism score was 91, which is third. Total score 81, which is seventh. Uh, and the 40 yard dash, he, had a, he ran a 4.34. Man was moving. 1.52 10 yard split, 39.5 jump, 11 feet 4 inch broad jump. Uh, the, his NFL comparison, funny enough, First, you Steeler fans out there is George Pickens. Uh, if you remember last week, if you listened to last week's episode, I talked about how these draft comparisons on the NFL draft website are not the most reliable. George Pickens' draft profile comparison coming out of college was Josh Reynolds, and he's way better than that. But this is a good player to be compared with. Usually they are compared to really 
these lowly players or bad players. I would say George Pickens is considered a great player already in the NFL. So for him to be compared to George Pickens already is uh, a, a plus. Nothing wrong with having two George Pickens on the Steelers. However, when the highlights come, I also I personally don't think he compares to George Pickens that much, but we'll get into that when the time comes. His overview is ascending product with size, speed, and ball skill to become a very good NFL receiver, but he's still in the process of bridging those traits. Mitchell can beat press and has the speed to take the battle off uh, battle to the third level, but he's still learning the art of bullying the catch space and tight quarters and jump ball battles, which I see on his tape, to be honest. He's not always a natural hands catcher, but his ability to snare balls outside his frame is top notch. His route running currently lacks focus and consistency, but agility and burst out of the breaks will not be an issue. Mitchell is rugged after the catch and has the ability to, be, ability to become a winner on all three levels. The difference between becoming a wide receiver two or wide receiver one can rest on his urgency and willingness to go to work on the unpolished areas of his craft. Well, let me tell you right now, if you're, when you're in the NFL, you better work on that craft, brother, because... That's how you stay in the league for more than three years or get booted out. His strengths are Flash's foot quickness needed to beat NFL press, speed shifter inside with the route with sudden change of direction, stands ground and keeps the landing area to boundary open on deep sideline throws, ridiculous catch web bringing in off-frame throws from all directions, already using the NFL two-foot drop near boundaries, which I do see on the tape, we'll get to that, patient long ball tracker and noted jump ball winner, and able to break tackles forward for positive yak. Yards after the catch, for people who are not familiar with what yak means. Uh, weakness, intensity can fluctuate from game to game. That's not great, since we already have been talking about we need players who show effort 100% of the time. That could be a big thing that I did not know about his game. He allows smaller players into a space to contest catches. He's a cradle catcher who fights football when catching with hands, needs to keep routes on time with better efficiency and finish, and doesn't play with aggression or sustain when asked to run block. Also, not a great sign, I'm going to be real honest with you. Those, there's two big things in that weakness that screams not a stealer to me, unfortunately. And that's uh, the, if the intensity can fluctuate and doesn't play with aggression to sustain blocks. We have been dealing with that already with receivers that we've had, and we don't need more of that, especially as we're a run-first kind of team. Um, sources say that if you can play every game, I can play the Alabama game. He'll be one of the best receivers in the league. They have first-round corners, and it gave them problems. Let's check out his highlights, shall we? Now, Donnie Mitchell doesn't have the best quarterback throwing to it, throwing it to him in college, but is what it is, right? Uh, these highlights come to you from Sick Edit HD on YouTube. Shout out to you, Six Edit HD. Um, with these highlights, if you are watching the video, you uh, if, if you watch along with the video or you're watching this podcast, whenever that happens to go out. Whenever that ever happens to happen, uh, you, you can see that he does have the big body frame. He was able to catch an outside route on that touchdown there. He's able to break free uh, on route. I mean, he, he's a decent route runner. I would say, like, overall on his skill set, it's very well-rounded. It's very balanced. He's able to run slant routes, outside routes, corner routes. Here's a good corner route. Catch it two feet inbounds, just like they talked about on the strengths. He's already was already practicing the two feet inbounds in college, which I think is smart for receivers. I think more receivers should do that. Um, his route running's pretty good. It's, you, know, you know, we talk about losing Deontay Johnson, who is the best route runner. This guy is not. You know, we're not, I'm not calling him Deontay Johnson in route running, but he's a well-rounded route runner, in my opinion. Watching the tape, he's smooth. He doesn't look even though he runs a four three. He doesn't look too fast, which could be concerning or good at the same time um but his body control is pretty decent he doesn't high point catches i know we have pickings for that but that could be an issue when you get to the nfl they're not high catches especially as a bigger body guy uh but yeah his routes are smooth they're right there he breaks wide open for a touchdown too easy for mitchell to be honest uh slants are really smooth and runs really gr uh, good slants he's really he's pretty decent with the yards after catch that we talked about as well um, here's another deep pass tracking it doesn't, doesn't need a high point out on that one, but kind of is what it is. Now, Adani Mitchell, we tell those two weaknesses, but I do think he is still a very solid receiver. I don't, I, when I'm watching highlights like these, I don't see George Pickens, George Pickens, even on his college highlights had, uh, it, you just saw athlete in George Pickens. You saw, uh, which you see on the field right now, he was spectacular catches. Crazy athletes. There's a quick slant pattern on uh, McKinstry 
And there's a deep out on the other Alabama corner. I don't think that's Arnold, though. It looks like Amos on his name. Um, but like I said, he doesn't have that athletic spectacularness that George Pickens even had on his college tape. But he just seems like a really well-rounded receiver. That would be really good to just put in our receiver room since we have George Pickens and a lot of mid in general. So in terms of skill and talent, if he can you know, clean up maybe the intensity or the run blocking, like he, he has all the traits to be... Uh, he has all the traits to help the Steelers out on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, from day one, he really does. He's just a well-rounded bounce receiver, a solid receiver based on the tape. And unfortunately, though, guys, if you are like me, there's another two two feet inbounds, nice body control catch. If you are like me though, and you want to see linemen in round one, an O line, uh, a tackle or a center, that's where a Donnie Mitchell is going to give you fits. I don't know if he makes it out of round one with the Bills and Chiefs needing a receiver so badly. And if he makes it out of round one in round two, you're looking at an early round two pick. And unless the Steelers trade back and get an early round two pick or whatever that may look like, I don't know how. I don't know how accessible or how available, I should say, uh, he's going to be when our picks come around. So um, it's kind of first round or nothing. First round might be a stretch to get a player like this, but I do think he's good. He had a top three visit. That always counts for something. So that is Adonai Mitchell. Let's move on to probably my favorite player, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite wide receivers in the draft class. And this, again, is just based off vibe. Sometimes, you know, guys, we, we, we always talk about scouts who say this and scouts who say that sometimes you just need to watch the tape and decide for yourself about what you like and this is a dude i just like even though his maybe his stats and his prospect stuff don't scream high caliber player to me to or, or in general they scream it to me so this is xavier leggett out of south carolina he's 6'1 221 pounds big body guy again uh 31 7 8 wingspan 9 inch hands 6.26 prospect grade, which is what will eventually be an average starter. You know, not great on that prospect grade. Production score was 74, which is 12th. Athleticism score was 82, which is 14th. Total score is 79, which is 13th. His 40 yard dash is a 439, a little bit slower than uh, a Donnie Mitchell, but I'll touch on that. 10 yard, 10 yard split, 1.54. Vertical jump, 40 inches. Broad jump, 10 feet, 6 inches. Uh, he's got no player comparison. Let's read his overview, strengths and weaknesses. It says, Leggett is a tight hipped with linear release that makes him susceptible to press. He uses his route running simply as a means to getting to the rendezvous point rather than a chance to con, to con coverage out of position. His star shines brightest once the ball goes up and he's able to use his body control, play strength, and ball skills to impose his will on the coverage. He's unlikely to, he's unlikely to become a smooth route runner, he can handle tough catches, and he has the stealth of, uh, acceleration that makes him a credible deep ball threat. Uh, add toughness as a runner and a run blocker to his profile to competitiveness, and he becomes a day-two talent with the potential to develop into a starter. Uh, speaking of acceleration, too, I'm just curious. I want to look back at Donnie Mitchell. No, even that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Anyways, his strengths are he makes full use of his size and plays strength in one-on-one -on -one battles. Uh, owns his space and defender's space when the catch is contested. He's magnificent timing and extension to snare throws up to the ladder, up the ladder. Uses subtle hand fighting to create late landing space for the throw. Powerful hands create added catch security with, with or without contact. Sneaky burst gear propels a vertical separation and run after catch speed. Capable combat, uh, combatant, <laughs> capable combatant when asked to do his part as a blocker. His weaknesses can, watch the, can win the catch phase, but the release and route phases lack polish. That's coaching. Tennessee's tight press man coverage was all over him for much of the game. Okay. You know, something to think about. Rushes through route design rather than selling it to the cornerbacks. Below average quickness getting in and out of breaks. Hits cruise control and waits for jump balls rather than keeping foot on the gas. That is probably the biggest red flag potentially for some of these things as you know, we don't know what these quarterbacks that we have, Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, are going to do when it comes to the deep ball stuff. But we're hoping we can throw more deep balls in our offense in general. And uh, we're going to have to see what that looks like. But this guy does catch a lot of deep balls. So that's kind of surprising that that is on his uh, scouting list. It says 2023, 20, 2023 is the first year he had over 30 targets in his entire career. So, of course, he's still green and should be moldable to whoever gets him. He's a good kick returner as well. 
Xavier Gets Highlight Tape, you guys, is something I really like. This comes from Prince Highlights on YouTube. Shout out to Prince Highlights. I mean, this first catch right here is just an easy slant, and then he's gone. He looks just way faster than Adonai Mitchell, and maybe that's just what he plays. Adonai Mitchell doesn't play very fast. He plays more smooth, well, more well-rounded. Adonai Mitchell plays fast. That was the first touchdown. Here comes a deep pass. Same game. Catch, release, gone. Another 70-yard touchdown. Right away, I'm impressed with just the speed and the, the strength in which he runs, like the effort that he's showing when he runs with the ball in his hands. And that shows up all over his tape. Uh, this is kind of a weird play where the camera can't track him, but wide open again, uses speed, breaks away, another long touchdown. He can be a deep threat. A lot of these catches you'll see on a highlight tape of Xavier Leggett's are going to be deep threat bomb kind of plays. That's the kind of player how he, who he is. Um, Spencer Rattler was throwing the ball. Threw a lot of deep balls. Threw some good balls, too. Here's another deep touchdown catch. Didn't high point it, but was able to box out the defender pretty well. I like, I mean, he uses his size. Well, the thing, the thing that I like about Xavier Leggett is he's kind of a freak in that way because he's a big body receiver, but he's fast, and he and that's a scary combination. This would be a, there's, a, there's a great body control catch, jumping up, high pointing it. Uh, he uses this big frame that he has, but with the speed he has, it's, it's such a combo. It's so dangerous. Great slant, jump up, box the, he boxes the cornerback out for a touchdown. It's just easy. It's light work, and I think a guy like that would be really dangerous with the Steelers on their team. They already have a lot of big body receivers uh, with George Pickens and Friar Muth and Darnell Washington, if they would ever use him. So getting a guy like this just kind of fits that mold. There's another great high point catch with the body control on the sideline. Xavier Leggett is someone who I'm really excited to see in the NFL in general. I is you know a lot of these draft profiles you watch the tape are just vibe. Sometimes there's another great high point catch, box the cornerback out. I, I just like what I see from this dude. He's able to use his speed. He's able to use his size to box people out. I know what they talked about. I know they talked about um, this route running and it is not as flashy or or it's not as polished. But a lot of those things that they talked about on his weaknesses I think are coachable and maybe not within the first year but down the line too I mean George Pickens wasn't the greatest route runner his first year either and he got a lot better second year expecting to get better of his third year there's another great acrobatic catch over top of a cornerback's head just mossed him but a lot of these passes are just deep throws there's Spencer Rattler going deep he's just barely able to stay in bounds grabs and a couple more yards after catch on that one I mean what more is there to say there's, uh, he looks, looks the part. Xavier Leggett is someone who I'll be looking for in the second round is where you're going to get him. He's not going to last to the third, you guys. So if you want Xavier Leggett, if you get the lineman in the first, or if you trade back, pick him in the second, whatever, but he could be there by number 52, but by the third round pick, not likely. But Xavier Leggett will be on our big board and I'm excited to see what he can do in the NFL. Up next is a receiver who I've seen mock to the Steelers a lot. Someone who we've talked about insiders in the Steelers realm on Twitter of being Nick Faribault and Alex Kazora. A lot of those guys have mentioned this player quite frequently, and that is Malachi Corley out of Western Kentucky. He is 5'11", 215 pounds, 32 in an eighth inch arm span, 9 and an eighth inch hands, production score 78, which is eighth, Athleticism score, 68, which is 31st, which surprises me based on his tape. And his total score is 78, which is 14th. Prospect grade is a 6.35, which is higher than Xavier Leggett's, according to his website. And will eventually be a plus starter. Malachi Corley also has a player comparison. And this one also is a really good player comparison. It's the first time I've seen really solid player comparisons on here. And it's for Debo Samuel. That's his player comparison is Debo Samuel. Uh, Corley is a big physical whiteout who has been asked to carry a heavy workload for Western Kentucky using his talent after the catch. Corley's highlight reel will be a full, full of broken tackles and general carnage left in his wake. He's an average route runner with tools to improve, but a disappointing drop rate and a contested catch rate are concerns relative to the way he plays the game in space. Like Dante Johnson. Sorry. 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 Didn't mean that. Didn't mean that. Kind of did. Uh, like Brandon, like Brandon Ayuk, future Steeler, or Debo Samuel when they were prospects, Corley has had a heavy percentage of his targets schemed around him, and he will need to prove he can become more than just a quick game bullet or gadget guy. He's good at what the team asked him to do, which is great jump-off point for evaluators considering him, him as a day-two selection and future starter. 
yeah, you'll see that from the tape when we go talk about it. A lot of the play designs are uh, screens or um, um, what are those called? Um, swing passes, screens or, or swing passes, uh, swing passes to just get the ball to him quickly and in space and let him run because he's so good with the ball in his hands with yards after catch. And we'll get to that. I mean, that's what I compared to Debo. His his yards after catch potential is very high. He's just a tough dude to bring down. Um, but it would be nice to see him run more routes, do more with what he can do there besides just that. However, this would have been a gold mine for Matt Canada uh, and his jet sweeps, but I'm glad we don't have Matt Canada, so don't even worry about that. His strengths are sturdy build, allows him to take on play aggression and a heavy workload. He runs routes with leverage and effective head nods to manipulate coverage. He has late twitchy hands to snatch throws suddenly. Flexible torso allows for full rotation to pull throws off his back hip. Creates chunk plays through vision and cuts back after the catch. And truck stick power to break tackles and punish perimeter defenders. Absolutely. We will see that in his highlights. His weaknesses. Has a tendency to struggle with contested catches despite being a tough player. Which is huge. That's very odd because he is a very tough player. He allows defenders to play through him and disturb his catch space. Also weird because he's so tough. He's become more stationary target when squatting in zones. Too jumpy. Average route runner who loses momentum coming out of breaks. Coachable. Lacking desired ball skills to win 50-50 balls downfield. Not great either, but you know what? I also don't think a wide receiver like this should be in a 50-50 kind of player, as bad as that sounds. Um, Not to say that, like, that's an excuse for him, but I just don't think that's the kind of player he should be in general. Uh, let's look at his highlights, shall we? Because they're good. We got Western Kentucky going up against Louisiana Tech first. Throws a little pass to him. Just trucks over the cornerback. See you later. Uses that speed. And he is gone. What did I say his speed was on here? Oh, it didn't have it? That's good. Anyways, uh, he's got some speed to him. He's fast. Here's another little crossing route. Run, he's out running the defense, just cannot be tackled. People are going at his legs, won't go down. That's why they compared to Debo Samuel. He's just a really hard dude to tackle. That was the second touchdown of this game. Here comes his third, a deep pass in traffic, and just ends up catching the ball. I know they talked about can't win the 50-50 balls. That one he happened to win. That's why it's part of the highlights. Obviously, they don't want to show drops on, on the highlight ball, but that's how it goes. Here's what I'm talking about when they do gadget plays. Here's a screenplay to him. Outrunning the defense, breaking t- he's already broken two tackles on this highlight alone. This cornerback is catching up to him, but will not be fast enough. That's another touchdown on a long screen play. Next pass play is another screen pass where he sets up his blocks, able to avoid the tackle, uses speed, gets outside, and he is almost gone. But a big chunk of change. Here's a swing pass. This is what I'm talking about, guys. Like like it's exciting because he can't be bro- he can't be tackled really. He just broke another tackle and he's gone for another long touchdown, probably seventy yards on that one as well. But every a lot of these plays are screens and swing passes. Here finally is not one. Here's a deep bomb. He just was outran the cornerback. Easy touchdown. Caught the ball and in the end zone. Uh, Malachi Corley though it was someone who I didn't really know a lot before doing this podcast or doing these highlight tapes. And I gotta say when I watched his highlights, I was more than impressed. I was kind of disappointed to even watch the highlights. Sometimes you just get a feeling about somebody. And this highlight tape actually switched my feeling around. I think the tape's there. I think he looks good. I've heard about the drops. Uh, we've experienced that with Deontay. That would be unfortunate to happen again. There was a great catch right there. But it's something about just the way he plays, you can tell that he runs hard and he runs through tackles and he has that Steeler mindset. I mean, it's a guy who could probably lay down some good blocks in the running game. He just he's trucks over dudes. He has that Steel City mindset. He's not afraid of contact. He's okay to to take to dish out the hits. George Pickens can do that in the blocking game as well. There's a deep catch for a potential touchdown. Yep, touchdown it is. George Pickens that can dish out the hits in blocking games, but when he catches the ball, he's never really hitting people. He's more like a gazelle out there, jumping over people, running, trying to run away. Where Malachi Corley, he can dish out punishment, and he just kind of fits a Steelers mold like that. I know we've only seen that recently with. Debo Samuel on the way the Niners play, but the Steelers can play like that too. And this, and he dishes it out. Here's a reverse play, gets to the outside, uh, broken tackle, and huge chunk of change. I mean, he's got the speed. He could probably do punt returns too, kick returns, who knows? Although we have Cortell Patterson for that. Um, there's a decent deep slant route. I mean, he looks solid, right? 
I actually, the more I've watched these highlights, the more I've gotten excited about Malachi Corley as a potential prospect. Uh, if you want to talk about where you could see Malachi Corley, I say, personally, in my opinion, third round. I don't think you draft him in the second. If he goes before the third round pick, that's just unfortunate for us. But I think he's a third round guy you pick up. Um, does that mean he be automatically becomes your wide receiver too? No, he still don't really have one, right? You're still trying to figure out what your wide receiver two is. I mean, down the line, he could be. I think the way he plays, like Debo Samuel and uh, his aggressiveness, and if Calvin Austin can come on, they, that could be a really solid one, two, three punch. But you're just hoping for the best at this point. You're not. You're just kind of banking on this working out in that sense. But third round pick is my pick from Malachi Corley day two. Uh, we'll see where he goes, where he lands. But right now, I like him and. Uh, and another guy, I'm excited to see how he does in the NFL, and hopefully he can play well. But you, you know, guys, when we do the draft prospects, and every guy's a winner. Sometimes I really like guys, and sometimes they just don't get a chance in the NFL. They just aren't good enough. I really liked Smoke Monday a couple years ago as a safety, and I, he's not in the NFL anymore. He, he was an undrafted free agent, barely in the NFL. Now, I, I don't know where, where he's at. I think he might be in Canadian football at this point, so who knows. Uh, the last receiver I'm going to talk about and briefly and show how it's on is someone I'm not really that excited about. This is a, strictly a vibes thing, but I've added him to the list because I've seen Nick Farabaugh, Alex Gazora, a lot of players uh, mock him to us again in the third round. He'd be a third round prospect. Uh, Jalen McMillan out of Washington. He was their wide receiver too. His, he is uh, 6'1", 197 pounds, 32 and an eighth inch arm span. 10 inch hands. He is a 5.97 prospect grade, the lowest we've been looking at. Average backup or special teamer. Production score is a 67. Athleticism score is a 78. Total score is a 73, which ranks 22nd. His 40 yard dash is 4.47, the slowest we've seen potentially since we don't see Malachi Corley's. You know, I'll look at Malachi Corley's just for us. Let's look up a Malachi Corley 40 yard dash. Just to see if he did it at his pro day. Oh, looks like he did the exact same. Um, he ran a 4.47. And Jalen McMillan also ran a 4.47. So same 40-yard dash time. 10-yard split was 1.53. Vertical jump, 37 inches. Broad jump, 10 foot, 7 inches. Uh, no player comparison. The overview. Slot target with good size and production over the last two seasons. McMillan is a long striding field stretcher who is at his best with momentum routes in a West Coast passing scheme. He lacks aggression and play strength and could labor against press or when faced with contested catches. McMillan has adequate build up speed to create opportunities down the field but needs the ball on target. Teams will need to determine if McMillan was a product of the impressive Washington passing scheme or his standalone talent outside of UW. I personally see that as he's a product of the team around him. Not that he was really that solid. Um, but again, you guys can have your own opinions. You guys can decide for yourself. That's just my viewpoint on it. Uh, strengths, slot target with a good size and big hands. Long strider who can create some space in mid-route. Able to con coverage out of phase, leverage and fakes. That's a, that's a good one. Nice track and stack to maintain downfield positioning. Run blocks from the slot with willing engagement. That's the first time we've seen that one too. Both of those are really great. Weaknesses, wasn't tested as much in the Washington scheme, which provided him with favorable releases and swaths of open space. Takes time to get to his route speed cranked up. I noticed that on his tape. Agitated and knocked out of rhythm by physical coverage. Seems to be missing a rundown gear to get up under deep balls. Noticed that as well. Focus and catch strength let him down on contested throws. Kind of noticed that as well, too. Also, I want to say before we watch Jalen McMillan's highlights, uh, Malachi Corley is a player that Steve Smith has really tried to shine some light on. If you aren't familiar with Steve Smith's uh, scouting reports on wide receivers, he's usually right on the money about who's going to be good and who's going to be bad, and he really likes Malachi Corley. So also keep that in your back of your head when you, see, when you see the negatives about him, about how he could end up being a really good player. Anyways, Malachi Corley, um, like I said, Washington, Michael Penix Jr. Um, I know, who's the other guy here? Jalen Polk is another good receiver they have. When I'm watching Jalen, Jalen McMillan highlights on the Washington tape, I just, you know, nothing really stands out. The speed doesn't stand out. He catches a lot of, a lot of passes that are wide open, a lot of deep passes. I'm going to kind of speed through some of this stuff. 
he catches a lot of a lot of deep balls. Um, I don't know. He's he's wide open. He's he doesn't do anything crazy. You know the the thing that he kind of reminds me of. I mean, it's because he's wearing number eleven and because it's a little longer. He reminds me of Chase Claypool. Whether you want to take that as a good or bad thing, I personally don't see that as a great thing because sure he's got skill to he's got skill there to contribute in a offense, but I just don't see anything special out of him. I don't uh, he, he's there's no contested catches. Um, there was he was able to high point a ball, but every but every time he tries to do something, I feel like it reminds me of Claypool, which is kind of like fake athleticism in a sense. Um, he's just wide open on things. I don't think he's a bad player per se. It's just that when people have been mocking him, he's kind of been the least excited I've been about a player watching the highlights. It's just very, it's all just very eh. It's okay. It's serviceable. We have a lot of serviceable guys on the Steelers roster already. So drafting a Jalen McMillan doesn't really move the needle for me. It just kind of adds another body on the roster when we already have a lot of a lot of these bodies on the roster. Uh, you know, and he can always prove me wrong. It'd be great if they decide to draft him. But he just, that's what it looks like to me. It doesn't look like doesn't look like anything that would be too crazy. I would say uh, he's probably gonna be drafted in the third round based on his pedigree around him as a player. I wouldn't draft him. I personally wouldn't draft him to the fourth. That's just me. Um, but he'll probably go in the third round. So if the Steelers want to get him, third round's probably where they have to go. But uh, yeah, that's Jim McMillan. I don't want to talk about him anymore. To be honest, he's he's okay. I mean, he's in a great offense. He has some really solid plays on his high tapes. I'm not trying to, but people are really excited about him. And that's fine. So if you are one of those people who are excited about Jalen McMillan, don't be discouraged by my opinions. These are just opinions by watching tape. Sometimes I'm right on the money. Sometimes I'm not. That's just how it goes. That's the fun of the draft. Um, that's all the receivers I have. Obviously, there's so many receivers to talk about. There's even some I wasn't able to talk about, like Brendan Rice, Jay Rice's son out of USC. I watched his tape. I really liked his uh, his tape, even though Caleb Williams is the one throwing the ball. But I still like the way he ran. He was aggressive. He's got good work ethic. You kind of have to be with Jerry Rice as your dad. He's also got a better prospect grade than Jalen McMillan. But he's looked at as a third or fourth round prospect. There's also Roman Wilson out of Michigan, who I know people like a lot. Um, so there's a lot of receivers out there. Chris actually has four other receivers to talk about. So stick around. That's what Chris has to say, and I'll give my opinions on that. Chris, my boy, take it away right now. What up, everybody? Good to be back. Uh, it, it kinda. Um, as Dom may have mentioned, uh, well, some life changes came up for me, but here I am. So let's get right into it. Um, and let's talk about receivers, shall we? So, uh, first guy I'm going to talk about is Troy Franklin out of Oregon. Now, Troy Franklin is, um, Six foot two, 176 pounds. Um, and he got a production score of 88, which ranks him fourth amongst wide receivers, 79, which ranks him 18th amongst wide receivers, with a total score of 84, which gives him a total of sixth out of all wide receivers in this uh, combined wide receiver draft class. Now, when I was going through my criteria of who I feel we should draft, who I think would be a great number two for our team. You know, Troy Franklin is definitely someone that jumped right out at me. Um, I mean, my criteria was we already have a guy in George Pickens who is an absolute monster. Like, yeah, he's quick, but he isn't necessarily like the separation guy by any means. You know what I mean? He is the dude who is going to, you know, jump up, get the contested catches, things like that. What I really think we need is a guy to replace DJ's skill set. So that was kind of my biggest thing when looking at all of these receivers. And uh, quite frankly, Troy Franklin hits that aspect for me so much. I'm so happy that I looked into his tape. Um, he, it was just very impressive from the start. Um, like I said, I I showed all of his uh, scores from the combine and everything. He ran a four four one forty yard dash, which is impressive. He is pretty quick, and that's something exactly what we need. I think George Pickens was around that four 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 five, um, so definitely keeping that speed up, which is great. Uh, with a broad jump of ten four, a vertical jump of thirty nine inches. 
Um, yeah, this dude was electric. I loved watching his highlights. I felt like he was very quick and shifty uh, and able to just move around the field very, very well. Um, his NFL comparison is Chris Olave, which I am not upset about at all. I think Chris Olave is a gr- good receiver right now in the league. I think he has the potential to be, you know, up there in the tops of of others if he gets the right quarterback play and can do well. Um, but the thing about Troy Franklin that really sets him apart from others is, you know, he can really turn his hips on a dime. He, the dude is so quick and he's able to adjust himself to make any kind of a catch uh, as necessary. Um, he's uh, very strong at pushing that vertical game. Uh, even if he doesn't do like a quick move or whatever, he was able to get around the cornerback and just use his impressive speed to really just like make corners have to, you know, immediately turn and, and, you know, get on their high horse. His acceleration is fantastic. Definitely something that I think will be great. You know, the second he catches the ball, dude's going to be flying down the field. Um, and I mean, not only does, you know, all that speak for itself, but the dude had a very impressive, uh, final season, uh, at Oregon. So in 13 games played, he had 81 receptions for 1,383 yards and 14 touchdowns. And I watched a lot of those. They weren't like just, you know, give me touchdowns. The dude turned on the jets and he really made a name for himself out there. And you can tell like he had steady progression from his first year at Oregon up until his last, uh, from, you know, getting very little playing time to seeing some more, uh, playing time last year and getting nine total touchdowns at almost 900 yards to getting nearly 1400 yards and 14 touchdowns. That's impressive. I think Troy Franklin is someone who I think the Steelers should really value um, and and take a, a definite look at. And what I really like about Troy Franklin, too, is you're not looking at first round. I I have voiced this before. I'm not sure if Dom has said it on previous episodes, but I just think that, you know, I would either much rather get a free agent or or trade for somebody in the league then use up our draft capital um, in a first round, round wide receiver. I think we should definitely be going offensive line. So Troy Franklin, to me, would be such a perfect candidate. I think we can get him second round, third round even. But like, hey, that means, you know, typically centers, they move down. So we could definitely get him in the second round and still get our guy at center. Hopefully, knock on wood, if that continues. Um, but he'd be someone that I'd be very, very, very happy to see the Steelers draft. Um, and just like a really explosive player. Um, as far as things go, um, you know, and his weaknesses, there's not really a whole lot to what I saw. Granted, you watch a highlight tape, right? I was I wasn't there at the games, I didn't see all that, but um, you know, from what I'm reading here, um he doesn't really stand out in the strength compartment or physicality like he's not going to be running into guys or you know i think and that's where his elusiveness comes in he's very uh fast and accelerates so he uses that over his strength any day which is totally fine um and uh, it looks like he has some consistent like you know issues with drops um i know that was everyone's big thing jumping down dj's throat was like his drops i really didn't think that was an issue but uh, if there's something that you want to maybe like hold, have your reserves for, drops are one thing. Um, but overall, this really solid player coming out of Oregon, someone who I definitely love to take. He scored a 6.35, which is a will eventually be a plus starter. Don't know what that plus means, but hey, he'll, he'll be a starter if we draft him. I know that much for sure. So that is my take on Troy Franklin. Uh, moving on down the list, I'm going to go with my second rated guy, also a speedster. You might know him. He comes out of the University of Texas, and that is Xavier Worthy. Now, Xavier Worthy is uh, kind, kind, of a, kind of a little dude. Um, he stands uh, 5'11", 
short. Uh, but here's the kicker. He is only 165 pounds. Yikes. Um, that concerns me. Obviously, he's going to gain some weight in the NFL level. You have to. You cannot be 165 pounds. I'm really curious to see what like Devontae Smith is because I know he was kind of in the same boat when he got drafted out of Alabama. Um, but if anything, that might be my NFL comp to him. I know the NFL comp they gave him, I really don't want to say because he's okay, but he's nothing special. But that's Darnell Mooney. Um, obviously he was kind of a top target for Justin Fields over in, uh, Chicago, but Darnell Mooney is now been traded. I can't remember where I want to say the Falcons, uh, Dom can correct me on that one or call me out. However, he proceeds to treat me, but Xavier Worthy did nothing but impress at the NFL combine. So his production score out of all, uh, 2024 wide receivers, was fifth amongst all all of them. Uh, athleticism score, dude ranked number one with a 98. Very impressive. Dude is athletic beyond belief. And he had a total score of 88, which ranked third amongst all wide receivers. And I mean, you think about the wide receivers coming out of this draft class, and you got like Malik Neighbors, you got Marvin Harrison Jr., um, guys who I'm not really sure if they participated at the combine, but if they did, this dude's ranking right up there as far as production, athleticism, and total score, which is impressive. Now, what jumps about Xavier Worthy? You know, well, first off, maybe the fact that he broke the 40 yard dash record with an impressive 4.21. Dude is zooming by you. It's not even a question, you know, and not only that, but like, yeah, he might be not on that six foot and overside, but that doesn't mean his, uh, impressive leg strength and jumping ability doesn't make up for it. The dude had an impressive 41 inch vertical and a broad jump of 10 feet, 11 inches. Now looking at his stats before I kind of go into his strengths and weaknesses, um, Dude had a pretty, pretty good year. Uh, and that's also with the fact that he's lining up across Adonai Mitchell, who is probably more highly ranked than Xavier Worthy is. Not probably, he is. And I really, really like uh, Adonai Mitchell. Dom touched on him or is going to talk about him later. Sorry for the spoilers if that was that. But um, to be across from Adonai Mitchell, the dude still had 75 receptions for over 1,000 yards and five touchdowns last year. Could not speak better things about this guy. Um, it looks like each year from 21 to 23, he has been a contributor to Texas's offense. As a true freshman, he was had a 981 yards with 12 touchdowns. 22, he had 760 yards with nine touchdowns and 1,000 uh, over a thousand yards with five touchdowns in his last year. Dude is balling and he definitely gets open. Watching his tape was just simply impressive. Um, I thought I wasn't going to like him. I watched Adonai Mitchell's tape before Xavier Worthy's, and I was like, well, normally college teams can't have two really stud receivers. Well, I can understand why maybe Texas could have a quarterback. Uh, getting eyes on him because he had two stud receivers who were not only quick, but they're able, they were shifty. They're able to create separation and oh my gosh, their ability to like turn their entire body to make these tremendous acrobatic catches. Yeah. I, that those guys could make any quarterback look really good. And so, um, I have nothing but good things to say about Xavier Worthy. He's definitely one of my top wide receivers that I would love to see in the draft. Um, some of his accomplishments, he's first team, all Big 12, uh, Big 12 Offensive Freshman of the Year in 2021, Freshman All-American, finalist for the Sean Alexander Freshman of the Year Award. Uh, yeah, the dude is just fantastic. 22, he was second team, all Big 12 Conference. Uh, led team with 60 receptions. Um, and in, even in 2023, he was third team Associated Press All-American. Uh, he was first team All-Big 12 Conference guy. This dude is recognized 
uh, amongst all of FBS, and I have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, some of his strengths, obviously, we touched on it, but his speed. He has deep speed. He's able to get around the guys. I think what sep- what's different between him and Troy Franklin is Franklin, like, yeah, he has some of that shiftiness, but, like, Franklin can just kind of, like, burst and accelerate and go past him. Whereas I feel like Xavier Worthy has a little bit more development when it comes to creating that separation between him and the cornerbacks. Uh, so I think not only does he have that speed to get around him, but he also has kind of that pivot move to create space and loosen coverage. Um, his separation is insane. This is why I think Xavier Worthy would be so important. And like I said earlier, trying to replace what DJ brought to the team, you know, that's a hard ask. And I think Xavier Worthy could do that. Would I like to see him gain some weight? Absolutely. In fact, that is one of his weaknesses. He is thin and he lacks functional strength. Uh, he needs to improve his efficiency. Um, and, and improve his hand strength. And obviously I think if he gets bigger, gets with the right uh, strength coach, which I believe the Steelers hired a new one, hopefully we can get him into a, a better place to be, uh, you know, a solid number two guy for us. So that's my take on Xavier Worthy. He is a really solid talent. He had a 6.29 prospect grade, which would eventually be an average starter. I think, you know, he can be right up there with Troy Franklin as far as being a plus starter. Again, not sure what the plus means, but it's a plus, which is not a negative. Anyway, moving on to my next guy, we got Mr. Ricky Purcell, or Purcell out of the University of Florida. Now, um, I just really wanted to start with this because I think it's hilarious, and I was going to bring this up to Dom, but um, they gave an NFL comparison, and I might look like the biggest non NFL fan, and this is might bite me. I should probably look this up before I say anything, but his NFL comparison Alex Erickson, who I have no idea who that is. I've never heard of that name. It's probably like some stud back from like the 70s, 80s, or 90s, but not a name that I recognize. Uh, so I apologize for that. But uh, Ricky Purcell. Um, was also pretty impressive to me watching his tape. Obviously, you know, you're going to see some neat things in highlights, but what I really liked about Ricky Purcell is the fact that he was so versatile into Florida's offense. Um, not only was he making phenomenal grabs in the passing game, but he was used a lot in end arounds. And he, you know, I wouldn't expect him to necessarily be that guy uh because he just kind of doesn't look as fast but you look at his combine scores and we got a 4 4 1 40 yard dash that's pretty impressive and the very first play you see when you look at any of his highlight tapes is this phenomenal phenomenal leaping one-handed snag where he gets hit immediately and still holds onto the ball bro that move made me have like i dropped everything my jaw especially was on the floor and i was like Oh my gosh. But enough about that. Ricky Persall is six foot one, 189 pounds. So definitely a taller guy, a taller target. Um, and yeah, the dude's a stud. His production score at the combine was a 69, ranked 23rd out of all receivers. His athleticism score was 85, which was seventh out of all receivers, with a total score of 78. Uh, which made him rank 16th out of all receivers that participated at the combine. Mentioned his 40-yard dash, which was pretty good. Um, maybe a little bit faster than what I would have pegged him to be. But um, again, these guys and their jumping ability is what really stands out to me and makes sense when I was looking at his highlights because this dude had a vertical jump of 42 inches and a broad jump of 10 feet 9 inches. Okay, that is some serious leg strength. This dude is able to get up in the air and get some contested catches. Um, Something about, you know, I've already said it a couple times. I was really looking for guys to take on DJ's place uh, in creating that separation. I kind of saw that a little bit. I mean, there's definitely times when he was just like very open and it's tough to watch it from a highlight perspective because you have no idea if that's based on him solely or if you know, that's just like broken coverage. Either way, the dude found ways to get open. And I mean, he was open. 
So I can only assume that it was like probably a mixture of both. But, you know, still very impressed. Um, let's see here. Some of his accomplishments here. Uh, he led the team in 2022 in receiving yards with 661 and five receiving touchdowns. And then he led the team again last year with 65 receptions for 90, 965 yards. Um, the dude had really good stats in his final season, uh, playing there in four touchdowns. Uh, he's just kind of a guy who's been fairly consistent. Um, transferred from Arizona State to Florida and still put up the same, if not better, um, stats, which is a great thing if you think about it. The Pac-12 is not a non-competitive league, but I'd rather see higher numbers coming from the SEC, especially Florida, who is not necessarily the best team in the SEC, but still being competitive out there. It's I had nothing but good things to say about uh Ricky Yeah um and then some of his strengths uh he sings his hips low to snap off the drive route suddenly uh you know he throws subtle jabs to leverage the corners so I think he has some pretty good strength uh, and obviously something that's just going to constantly get better um, assuming his strength continues, um, you know, he has very soft hands, so he catches the ball very quiet. He adjusts his tracks and lays out to make catches. The dude is a baller. Um, some of his weaknesses though, um, he doesn't, you know, these are kind of poor, I, I think anyway, but just talking about his high number of catches, um, coming off of uncovered you know, targets. So like, like I was saying before, I wasn't sure if it was like, you know, him creating the separation or just getting open. It looks like some of the weaknesses were a lot of his, uh, catches were coming off of just being uncovered in general. Uh, and he doesn't have that suddenness to slip past, uh, a cornerback. So again, some of my biggest concerns and what I'm looking for in drafting a receiver this year I really want to see a dude who's quick and who can create separation. I'm not saying I'm closing the book. I think Ricky can be a c- contributor. He's great, you know, contested ball uh, receiver. And I think, you know, pa- pairing him up with George Pickens would be sick. I just have guys who I'd rank ahead of him. Personally, I'd give him a draft grade of like round three or four, personally. Maybe even like if the draft goes a certain way. You could see him like sneak into the fifth round, but um, I really don't see that happening. So I'm going to stick with like round three or four for him. And then the last guy that I have to talk about who I've seen Nick Faribault, you know, speak highly of um, and, you know, a few other people is Mr. Jalen Polk um, out of Washington. Paired up with Michael Penix Jr. Um, now the dude on paper looks really good, and I'm not saying his highlights were not impressive. The dude had really, really good highlights. Again, I just was looking at such a criteria to where I think it really clouded my my judgment. Um, and and I think Jalen Polk will be a phenomenal receiver for whatever team he goes to, and if he comes to us, I will be very happy about it. My biggest thing is he wasn't someone that really created a lot of separation. Was he good at the contested grabs? Yes. Was he able to adjust his body and turn his hips to make these really, really good catches? Yes. His ability to create that separation, I, th- I felt like guys were on him constantly, which he kind of had to be that contested catch guy. Um, so I just really want to you know, make sure when he takes that jump to the next level, especially going from the Pac-12 to the NFL, you got to be able to create that separation or at least find ways to get open. Not saying Jalen Polk won't be able to do that, but um, we will see. So Jalen Polk, again, University of Washington, he's six foot one, 203 pounds, definitely the beefier of our boys. Um, he had a production score of 75, ranking 10th among receivers, athleticism score of 80, ranking 15th, and a total score of 80, which ranked him 8th out of all receivers. Again, I 
I can't run this fast, so I don't even know why I'm saying it's slow. A 4.52. I think that was like kind of close to what Pickens ran, which again is not bad. I think Pickens was 4.4, but um, you know, his combine results don't really jump out at me. It was 4.52 for his 40. His vertical jump was 37 and a half. Still, still good. I mean, that's over three feet of a jump with a broad jump of 10 feet, nine inches. Um, so yeah, um, again, he didn't have an NFL comp, um, his strengths, uh, he has an NFL body type. He's able to come off the jump ball and really battle those contested catches. Uh, it looks like strength and, and just body control seems to be a huge thing for him, which is awesome. Uh, he stays committed to his routes, which is huge. I know a lot of times last year, and I'm blaming this solely on Matt Canada, our routes kind of, you know, came and went. Things weren't communicated well. He it sounds like he really sticks with what he's got and uh, makes sure he's, you know, goes with it. Um, and he always gives effort, uh, whether that is through the receiving game or uh, when he's doing the run block, which I know a lot of people are probably pretty high in this because they remember that Bengals game with DJ when he just kind of gave up. I think he didn't see what was going on, but that is beside the point. Until that whistle blows, you are blocking your man and you're doing everything you can. Weaknesses. Uh, must prove that he can play with better burst and suddenness. This is what I'm saying. He's not very quick. He's not explosive. I think, you know, he can be right up there with the guys and really snag the ball, but he didn't really create that separation or get around guys. You know, uh, he's too gradual getting into the top of the route, uh, below average, uh, you know, salesmanship. So I'm assuming he just uh, kind of gives himself away a little bit, doesn't really stoop up a lot of defenders, and he takes too long to transition from catch to run, uh, which, you know, that yard after catch probably isn't going to be his biggest thing. Um, but that's all right. Looking at his stats, he did have a really solid last season with Washington, having 69 catches for 1,159 yards and nine touchdowns. Obviously, he he was a stud. He's a transfer out of Texas Tech, played Washington his last three years. Dude is really, really good, and I think he's going to be a contributor wherever he goes. Personally, I have guys ranked ahead of him, probably each person on this list, maybe not Ricky, but um, again, my criteria was solely based on wanting to find shifty, quick dudes uh, who can create separation um, and provide a different skill set for the Steelers replacing that DJ-esque vibe, okay? Um, where I'd put him in the draft, kind of the same thing with Ricky. I'd say, like, I could see him going as high as, like, a two just because I think he has some good production, but I'd give him a three or four uh, round grade. I think he's going to be really good and someone who you can get probably later in the draft. Um, yeah. Thank you. Good to see you all. Uh, look forward to being back, but I'm going to do another one here uh, with Dom later. Peace. Thank you, Chris, for those insightful and amazing words about those wide receivers. So let's, let's give you my quick opinions, right? Xavier Worthy, shifty dude, really fits that role of Deontay Johnson, fast. Um, you're looking at, I mean, he could be potentially a first-round pick. Second round at the earliest, both Texas guys, the Donnie Mitchell and Worthy, could go really high up there. There's an option if you trade back, but yeah, he kind of fits that Deontay Johnson mold pretty well. Uh, you're looking at Jalen Polk, who I think is a really solid big body guy who can play in there. Uh, you're looking at um, Franklin, who we're able to get more insight on and be excited about. That is someone to kind of circle on your board. Just like Chris said, I think that could be a really good spot for somebody. And um, I think there's a lot of options out there for the Steelers. A lot, of, a lot of really good options. Again, if they trade for Brandon Ayuk, hey, that's the way it goes. This episode doesn't mean anything for Steelers anymore, but it's still good for you guys to know some information about these guys. So thank you for listening to the Northern Steel Podcast. This has been the wide receiver episode. The next episode is going to be cornerbacks. We're going to try and sneak in one more for the draft. Um, but I, uh, if you are listening and you've gotten this far, and I'm, I should really start putting this part in the intro. I'll do it in the next episode for sure. <laughs> we are going to do a live stream of the draft like we do every year, but this time on YouTube, YouTube slash Northern Steel Podcast. We're going to do a live stream of the draft. I got some uh, buddies we're doing it with 
who are some Viking fans. We're going to do a big board. We're going to eat some spicy wings. We're going to give our reactions on every pick going through the draft. It's going to be fun. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be entertaining. Uh, if you want to watch the draft with us and comment your opinions or c- comments that we're a bunch of wusses eating these hot wings as we're crying about it, please do so. You can follow us on YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter for information. You can follow us on TikTok. And you can follow us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Google Home, and on uh, Club Penguin. And I will see you guys for the next episode. Deuces.